I'd like to uh, wish everybody a good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim and uh, we'll, let's get this meeting started. For those of you who have not been here before or have been here before, we'd like to review our brief format. We will have our a brief announcement period, our speaker, our question and answer period, and our uh, rebuttal period. At the speaker's request, we're not taping the question and answer period nor the rebuttals tonight, but we will get a presentation at her request. Uh, my name is Tim. Now we're going to hear something about the water reclamation district because Mariana is a commissioner of the uh, water reclamation district of what is it, Greater Chicago? Of the world. All right, uh, and. Not only that, but she has all sorts of literature here on what you might have to drink after you've thrown it down the toilet or the sink uh, in diluted form. Uh, uh, so be careful what you do. Uh, but we will also uh, hear a little bit about, I guess, the the uh, overflow of the uh, uh, deep tunnel and all sorts of other stuff about how our water is purified and uh, I don't know what else is done to it, but we'll find well, out Jesus, from Mariana. Jesus, all right, without any mind. further ado, we will hear from Mariana. Mariana Skoropoulos. First of all, thank you very much for pronouncing my name correctly. You would be surprised at how many different versions of that I get, but I appreciate that. Thank you. Probably the ancient Greek you took in grammar school or something, or high school, right? <laughs> and thank you to Charles for inviting me and setting up uh, the speaking opportunity. So my name is Mariana Sparopoulos, one of those easy Greek names that rhymes with Metropolis. There you go. And I'm one of nine commissioners. There's nine commissioners that sit on the board of the Water Reclamation District, and every two years, three of us are elected. Um, and the, the way that I got on the board is um, I originally ran for the office in 2008. Um, I was not successful at that time. Uh, one of the commissioners uh, retired, and I was appointed by the governor in 2009 to fill that vacancy. And that term was up in 2010, so I had to then run for the office again in 2010. And I was elected at that time. So just to give you a little perspective. So here are the commissioners. Um, Kathy Meany is in the center. She's our president. Barb McGowan on the left is our vice president. And I'm the chairman of finance. So someone asked me um, whether this was the sanitary district. When it was originally created back in the 1880s, it was called the, um, the sanitary district. And in 1989, um, we changed the name uh, to the um, Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago. But we just call it the district. It's a lot easier. So <clears throat> our service area is 883 square miles of Cook County. We're a countywide agency. Uh, we include the city of Chicago and 125 suburban communities. Um, we have elected board, which I already mentioned, and we have six-year terms. Um, so be although I, was, I entered uh, the commission in 2009, my term started in 2010 when I was elected, and I'll be up again in 2016, God willing, right? Um, the initial mission for the agency was to, to protect uh, uh, the drinking water um, of, the, of the community, um, and we do that through seven filtration plants throughout Cook County, and I wanted to uh, mention to your group that if you would like a tour of one of our plants, um, I'd be happy to um, set that up. It would be during the day, obviously, um, and you certainly don't want it during the summer because it's a little aromatic. Um, but other than that, and you know, and if anybody doesn't want to walk too much, we can uh, we can uh, adjust for that as well. But it's a very interesting process um, to see, and, and no doubt they would take you down to Stickney 
which is right near Cicero, and show you how the facility works. <coughs> um, I'll get into a little bit of the history of the agency. Um, but uh, on this slide, we also, so we do two things. We treat wastewater through the seven filtration plants that we have throughout Cook County, and we manage stormwater through our deep tunnel project. Um, also called TARP, which, is, which stands for Tunnel and Reservoir Plan, but throughout the decades that it's been going on, it's, it's become to be known as the Deep Tunnel Project. And the Deep Tunnel uh, Project is comprised of two things. It's 109 miles of intersecting tunnels that takes the overflow from the local sewer system, and it's three reservoirs. We have one reservoir online um, at O'Hare. We have another one that we're working on at McCook. And our final one in Thornton um, will be online. We just had the last blast that was featured in the media recently, last Monday. Um, and that will be online in 2015. So, so here's uh, Chicago. <coughs> Excuse me. Before commercial and industrial residential buildings, um, and many of you may already know this, but Chicago consisted of, of a lot of marshes um, and very soggy area um, where you know a lot of the water was being absorbed into. Um, and there was a lot of clay as well. And that sort of um, becomes an important component when uh, the deep tunnel is being um, dug as well as for absorption purposes when people are concerned about why the water is not absorbing into the ground. <clears throat> so here's Chicago in 1820, some artist's rendition of what it looked like. Clean air, clean water, looks peaceful. And a few years later, this is what happens. 1857, the city grows rapidly and primarily due to the fact that we have this great um, source of drinking water, um, Lake Michigan. So back in the 18, uh, this is 1850, but and the population is around 90,000 people. It becomes one of the busiest ports in the United States because of our riverways as well as Lake Michigan. In the 1880s, Chicago is putting its waste in the Chicago River. The Chicago River is running east into Lake Michigan, and Lake Michigan is the source of everyone's drinking water. So you can, you know, jump to your own conclusions as to what's going on here. Um, a lot of people are getting sick, <coughs> excuse me. The state legislature in 1880 decides to create the agency, and one of the first things they do is reverse the flow of the river. Now, given the time period and, and the type of construction materials that they had and the knowledge that they had at the time, it's a pretty impressive feat to reverse the flow of the river, and it became world, world known that um, Chicago did this. But, it was basically to save the community um, for and, and save the drinking water and um, its integrity. And the downside to that is downriver was receiving Chicago's waste because the waste was still going in the river but going in the other direction. Yes. But we'll get to that. I'm trying to get to it. <clears throat> okay. I, I can't wait. Can I ever bring your water back? So here we have um, the early stages as indicated by the horses of what our local sewer system was. You had your home, you had a local uh, sewer system, and that just went right into the waterway. Beginning in the 1850s, the city of Chicago and other municipalities built sewers to carry sanitary sewage and a limited amount of stormwater directly to the, to the waterways. This was before our treatment plants were built because we started uh, uh, building the plants in the 1920s and 30s. And here's one of the original cribs, built in 1867. Um, source of Chicago's drinking water. I'm always amazed at hearing the stories about how the guys would, um, would you know, with a shovel, be uh, shoveling tunnels between, you know, how many miles out into the lake that is in Chicago. I think it's, it's pretty impressive, um, the type of, of courage that sort of took. So, and in 1885, a major storm flushed polluted river water out into Lake Michigan. Remember, this is before they reversed the flow of the river. 
near the water collection cribs, which is a source of drinking water, raising public health concerns. And as a direct response, the Illinois legislature in 1889 created the Sanitary District. And this is uh, one of our four intake cribs in 2013. <clears throat> Excuse me. And as it did over 100 years ago, the city of Chicago collects drinking water from close to the bottom of Lake Michigan. Oops. Today there's four offshore water cribs approximately three miles from shore. So the cribs are th about three miles out into the lake. The water is then directed through pipes to a pumping station that's on the shore um, of Chicago. The water is processed and filtered at the Jardine Purification Plant, and that's what most people think is the Water Reclamation District. So remember I was telling you we're wastewater and we're storm water. We're not drinking water, but what we do can affect that drinking water, and I'll, I'll mention that later. Um, the Jardine Filtration Plant is, is um, run by the city of Chicago. It's the largest water filtration plant in the world, which sends nearly one billion gallons of water per day to consumers in the north and central portions of Chicago. So here's, um, now we start looking at the reversal of the flow of the river. So this is the area before the reversal. Note the water intake cribs, they flow direction, flowing um, directionally, you know, out to the river and pollution was heading into the lake, which we, we talked about before, and the subcontinental divide that extends north to south, down, down the center of the map. It went is on its way. So when, when it would rain, the water that would be east of the continental divide would run into the lake, and the other water would run into the Des Plaines River running west. So without the option of treating the wastewater, uh, the Water Reclamation District undertook the, the reversing of the flow of the river, which I mentioned before. The polluted water from these rivers was sent through a system of man-made canals to the Des Plaines River, where it was diluted as it flowed into the Illinois River and eventually the Mississippi River. And so that's how Chicago was getting rid of its waste at that time, before the treatment plants were built. Here's a sort of a, a side view of how the Chicago River was reversed. Gives you a little bit of, uh, and, any engineers here today? Anybody in the engineer? Okay. Engineers get excited about this stuff. So. And so these are always very fascinating. These are the historical photos, and there's a lot of them. If you go, ever go to um, the Water Reclamation District, either Facebook page or the website, they have a lot of historical photos that show um, these initial projects that they were working on. So this is <clears throat> mountains of rock were removed from the channel and um, it took quite a few years to accomplish that, considering the equipment that they had at the time. So here's an aerial view um, of Wolf Point, downtown Chicago. Polluted water from the north branch meets clean lake water from the main stem. So you can see the color of the water and there's the clean water from, from uh, the lake. The waterway system worked well in dry weather but during heavy rains the overwhelmed river flowed in both directions and drained polluted water into the lake. Additionally some portions of the waterway were heavily polluted by industrial sewage. Here we have another historical photo and this is Bubbly Creek. I'm sure many of you have heard of Bubbly Creek small tributary to the South Branch that received waste from the Union Stockyards, one of the largest industrial operations on Earth at the time. And one of the, um, it drained all of its waste into a small sluggish stream on the South Branch of the Chicago River known as Bubbly Creek. And legend has it that the Bubbly Creek was so saturated with pollution that a chicken could walk across the surface. <laughs> So these are, are some um, images follow, followed by charts and a photo from the district's experiments on treatment options for the stockyard waste. So even at that time, people were aware that this was a problem, this was not good for the community, and we needed to do something. 
So the Water Reclamation District determined to improve water quality in the Chicago area waterways, began studying methods of treating industrial and sanitary, sanitary sewage, and once the technology was proven, the district built the treatment plants. So like I said, in the 1920s and 30s, we started building our, our treatment plants. The district built treatment plants throughout the area and the network of huge intercepting sewers to carry sewage to them. So ideally what you want to have is another sheet of all the local sewer systems that are hooked up to people's homes. That's going to take the uh, waste and the stormwater to our interceptors. And this is where our agency takes over and carries everything to whatever plant is geographically close to wherever the community is. This is an interesting shot, 1954 of downtown Chicago, um, showing the newly completed Sun Times building, and now the Trump Hotel. By the 1950s, the district was capturing roughly a billion gallons of combined sewage and stormwater per day, already at that time because we say we treat about 1.5 billion gallons of wastewater per day. The treatment system included the largest wastewater treatment plant in the world, which is Stickney, and it worked very well during dry weather and minor rains, um, and that improved water quality. So here's an illustration of that system, where you have the home set up to the local sewer system, the local sewer system set up to our interceptors. And then if there was overflow, because we have combined sewer systems, and for anybody who doesn't know what that is, oh, thank you. Combined sewer system is stormwater and wastewater together in one system. So right here is the interceptor, and your the waste from the home is coming through here, but also your gutters and your streets are bringing storm water into this. And when this overflows, still at that time, this is before tarp. So this is just, um, this is probably like in the 50s and 60s. We're not at the deep tunnel yet. And that's still going into the, the water system. So by the 1960s, the combined sewer overflows were happening about 100 times a year, and that still affected the water quality. And this is before the Clean Water Act, too, which was in 1970. So now um, the Water Reclamation District comes up with this idea. We have to um, provide another component to this, this infrastructure system to, to deal with the storm water, because we've got huge storms going on. So, Again, we've got the stormwater. We've got the wastewater from the home going into our interceptors. When that overflows to prevent it from com uh, compromising the quality of our water, we're now getting that to go into our tarp system, the deep tunnel project. And so this is uh, part of that 109 miles of intersecting tunnels throughout the county. And these are 33 feet in diameter these tunnels. So this is how, this is the m machine that they use to um, build the deep tunnel. And apparently it's the same machine that they use to build the tunnel between London and Paris and um, some other countries used it as well. Apparently everyone was using the same machine. <clears throat> So TARP, or Deep Tunnel, is one of the largest civil engineering projects ever undertaken because of its scope and complexity. Phase one was primarily designed for pollution control and consists of 109 miles of deep tunnels that were completed in 2006 and provide storage for 2.3 billion gallons of water, um, which is held until it's treated. So let's say we have a uh, intense rainstorm, and I'll talk a little bit about this when we talk about flooding. We have this intense rainstorm. It's going in. Okay. So you get your your you got your rainstorm and you get you got your uh, wastewater. 
you got the wastewater, you got the storm water, it's going in here. If the rain stops and this is full, this will all be directed to a treatment plant and cleaned, and then um, it'll come out of our plant called effluent, but it'll be cleaned to the standard that we're required. Now, if this, if the rain continues and overflows to this, then there's, and because our reservoirs are not online yet, some of that water has to be diverted to the lake. And that's when you hear about these lake incidences. They don't happen very often, but unfortunately sometimes that's the only place that some of that water can go. <clears throat> um, the Thornton and McCook and Majewski reservoirs comprise TARP phase two. Those are the reservoirs that I was talking about before. The Thornton Reservoir um, is scheduled for completion in 2015, and it will protect 182,000 um, structures and serve 556,000 people in 14 communities, and it's gonna provide 7.9 billion gallons of storage. The McCook Reservoir will provide 10 billion gallons of storage. This sounds like a lot when you're talking about billions of gallons, but when I tell you that one inch is 15 billion gallons of water, that's why we have to start looking at green technology, but we'll get to that in a little bit. So just some of the other projects throughout the world that also use the same type of mechanism and approach to uh, some of their, their problems. So in addition to developing and implementing um, the plan um, that's going to reduce combined sewer overflows, the Illinois State Legislature granted, granted the Water Reclamation District the authority to do stormwater in 2004. Since we were already working with our, uh, our deep tunnel, we were taking care of some of that stormwater. Cook County government was, doing, uh, was handling stormwater prior to that. We then took it over. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about flooding and sewer backups in the Chicago area. And, and to understand this requires going back to how the area looked hundred, hundreds of years ago in the early 1800s. Um, Chicago and its surrounding area is built on a flat, low-lying land. We were talking about clay, the clay layer that is um, in the region. And since the landscape is so flat, Chicago River naturally flowed slowly, dropping only a few feet in elevation and meandering through marshes before draining into Lake Michigan. When it rained, water was in no hurry to drain away from the flat landscape. The river would spread out and flood wide areas and the marshes and ponds would turn into large lakes. Displains River, which formerly flowed to the, uh, normally flowed to the west, would sometimes overflow its banks. So we saw, earlier we saw a different illustration of the sanitary and ship canal. This is a, another view of that. By cutting through the subcontinental divide that we talked about before and flowing to land that is actually lower than Lake Michigan, the um, Chicago area waterways lets the Chicago area drain down a steeper slope um, than it could if it drained into the lake. So here's the area before 1900. Um, the, the Water Reclamation District undertook an incredible plan to protect the lake by reversing the flow of the river. And um, to reverse the flow, the district constructed a 61.3 mile system of canals, um, including the Calumet Channel, the Sanitary and Ship Canal. And some municipalities are built on land that was formerly lakes and marshes. As a result, drainage is a battle for the Chicago area because the natural tendency of the landscape is to flood. The polluted water from these rivers was now sent through a system of man-made canals away from Lake Michigan to the Des Plaines River beginning in 1900, where it was diluted as it flowed into the river Mississippi and the Mississippi River. So here again, we have uh, sort of an illustration of the ladder of connections from your home, local sewer system, into the waterways. Our intercepting uh, sewers. 
And when it would overflow from uh, uh, heavy rainstorms, it would go into the waterway. Our deep tunnel. And just an illustration of how the deep tunnel goes into the reservoir. Um, and like I said, the one reservoir is online and two more um, are being worked on. So this is supposed to be um, an interactive um, visual. Let's see if it works. Okay, so you know the concept is pretty straightforward in terms of backup. I hope he, no one has experienced backup in their backup or flooding in their homes here. No? Okay. Um, but basically, uh, you've got a local sewer system where the pipe is not very large and you have a large uh, quantity or a large volume of water that's trying to all get into that same small pipe. Although there may be a huge reservoir down the line that can hold all this water, it can't get to that point. So um, where the lateral connections were, it's backing up into people's homes because it can't get through the local pipe fast enough. And I think the city of Chicago, part of its current um, upgrading of the infrastructure is they're working on some of the pipe systems. I know they were looking at some pipes that were made of wood from, you know, the 1880s. It's pretty amazing. So here, oh, it's, it is working a little bit. We got a combined sewer system and dry weather. So that's ideally how you know you want it to work. three connected systems. So one of the things in term, that you have to look at in terms of um, the stormwater component and why we're experiencing so much, um, so much uh, moisture and precipitation and why it's affecting people is that we have climate change. I know some people are on the fence as to whether climate change exists or not. United Nations came out with a study that says 95% sure that this climate change does exist. And um, you know, scientists have studied it and show that and rainstorms are becoming more and more intense in the, in the recent years. You have an increase in population, you have an increase in development, which uses concrete. Concrete cannot absorb water you have an increase in the intensity of the rainstorms. So you have a problem with water. That water cannot absorb into the ground. It's all battling to get into that small local sewer system. You have backup in, backup in people's homes. Not only do we have the deep uh, tunnel project, but we also have stormwater management ordinance, which excludes the city of Chicago because they have their own stormwater. Um, uh, approach. Uh, our ordinance is to help the communities in the Cook County area outside of Chicago. The purpose of the ordinance is to uh, encourage the use of green infrastructure and that will, um, I'll give you an example of how this will work. So let's say you're a developer, you want to build an apartment building. Your apartment building will be X square footage and you want to use concrete. You will then have to use um, you'll have to have a detention area because you're taking away a certain square footage of concrete where that water can't be absorbed into the ground, you will then have to have X square footage of detention area to hold that water. That water that would have gone into the ground will now be held and you'll, you'll be responsible for that. So in terms of economics, if you're a developer, you can imagine that um, it, we have to be able to be creative with this in terms of giving people an opportunity to um, use green infrastructure in different ways so that they can get credit for absorbing that water. So people can use rain barrels, rain gardens, uh, green roofs, bioswales, all kinds of different components to capture that water. That's the point of it all. So what people have to try to start understanding is these intense rainstorms are basically the new normal. This is, this is not something that's going to go away. We're going to have to have an approach to try to, um, to deal with it. 
So people have to, you know, look not only at their home in terms of how they're dealing with the, the precipitation, but also their local sewer systems. Um, municipalities are going to have to be looking at how they can try to improve that to help people so that they're not experiencing um, backup. So if someone has um, a uh, flooding issue, they need to contact their municipality um, to report their, their residential flooding. Um, like I mentioned before, we've got the deep tunnel project and we have an ordinance, um, but we are also, um, we have a rain barrel program, if anybody's interested in that. If you purchase the rain barrel, we sell it at cost, at our cost, which is about $50, and we will have it delivered to your home and help you set it up as well. Um, but in terms of looking at flooding from a, a macro perspective in a community, if one person in your community has the rain barrel, that's good for them in terms of saving on spent, you know, spending money for water. They can use it to water their plants, wash their car, but you want to have a comprehensive approach to capturing that water. In other words, you, we, want, we as an agency want to work with the local communities and have everybody have that rain barrel. Um, and that's 50 gallons in every home. Um, that could have a, a, a better, a more positive effect in terms of what water is going into the local sewer system, not just one person. So we do, um, our agency also looks at um, uh, river, river bank uh, stabilization. Um, in terms of uh, uh, you know helping the integrity of the river system, these are some before and after photos of, of some of the things that we do. And here are the rain barrels that I've talked about. I'm sure most of you know or have seen a rain barrel. So not only um, collecting rainwater is an environmentally friendly practice, but those of us living near Lake Michigan, which is about 20% of the world's fresh water in Lake Michigan. Um, we have plenty of drinking water. We turn on the faucet 24-7 and we have clean water, but this water is a precious resource and we need to protect it. The lake level um, has lowered significantly last summer due to the drought of 2012, and um, fortunately recent snows have helped that lake level, but we don't know how next winter um, is going to be. So here's an example of a rain garden. So just sort of basically an environment um, that is aesthetically pleasing and can absorb some of that water instead of contributing it to um, the sewer system. Another alternative is porous pavement. Um, this is um, at our Stickney plant. We have three different types of porous pavement that we're testing out to see how the absorption rate uh, works. And this is one of them. Also, native prairie landscaping is another option for those gardeners that um, are here. Uh, some plants absorb water better than others, so something to look into. Some trees also um, absorb some of the water as well. Better than others, bioswales swales is another option. A lot of communities are building um, this as another option to capture water. Green roofs. Thank you very much. <laughs> this is a uh, city hall, so this is their green roof on top of city hall. And greenways, a lot of communities outside the city um, are building greenways to absorb uh, the water. Green alleys and walkways, these are, are mostly in the city of Chicago. And wetlands. Um, this is a little further north in the city. Community groups, um, you know, uh, particularly schools, getting students uh, conscious of, of how to uh, work with the environment and how it's changing, but also having them connect with their community. Great view of the city. Besides using less water, there's other things uh, individuals can do. Um, 
you know, in terms, you, you can capture water, uh, you can, you know, small you. tips when you're taking a shower, you, you can put a bucket uh, to capture some of that water and use that water for your plants or use it, for, you know, obviously if there's no soap in it, um, you know, for various things. Now you want to be conscious of uh, the water supply. Um, Although we are spoiled in the Midwest with a great source of drinking water, which different communities in the United States would like a part of, um, I think that we sh it's important that we be stu good stewards of our natural resources. And I thank you very much for the invitation to share this information with you. And at the end of my presentation. Before we go, can you give us the website and your, uh, how does somebody get, just give us the website where they can find this information at? Sure. And if you'd like more information, our website is mwrd.org. Um, and on that website are the emails for all the commissioners. If you have any other um, information that you would like for me, I'd be happy to do that. Or if you would like uh, me to help you set up a tour of one of our plants, I'd be happy to do that as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, your